Hello, seniors. We're going to talk about the rest of chapter 14 today, as well as the short story of Ellison's I Asked You to Read, A Party Down at the Square. Um, if you've read Ellison's short story, and hopefully um, you have, if not, you still have a few hours to do so. Um, it's something that if you read the afterward, Ellison probably never intended to publish. Um, the afterward in the Esquire article, the original place where it was published, said that it was found after his death in a little box um, in his apartment among his belongings. And so it seems to be an exercise, probably an early exercise of Ellison's um, to kind of develop his writing style. Nonetheless, it's an incredible um, piece of writing. I think we see a lot of Ellison's style already at work there. Obviously, um, you know, race being an issue since it, it centers around the lynching of this black man in the Southern town. Um, but also the kind of dreamlike quality, the the plane that crashes and kind of upsets the whole situation, the ideas of electricity, the ideas of um, sickness, um, literally vomiting. These are all things that Ellison um, has, you know, pretty prominently an invisible man. And so I think as kind of an artifact that we can use to understand how Ellison developed and what Ellison you know, had he written more than Invisible Man in terms of novels or published fiction, um, would have really focused on. It, it's an interesting story from that regard. I'll bring up some more ideas um, I think you could discuss if you decide to um, go with that prompt for it in a bit. But I want to jump into chapter 14 and get through as much of that as I possibly can here so that um, you feel like you have a good amount to work with. So yesterday we stopped um, just as, yes, that's Pico, if you're wondering, that's not me meowing, that's my kitten, but yes. But anyways, um, we stopped with chapter 14 yesterday, about halfway through, um, really with things kicking off at the Chthonian. And in looking at, I think, the 29 slides I had in this presentation to discuss, I realized that was far too many. So I'm going to try to speed things up a bit. And um, if I feel like a slide is repeating an idea I had somewhere else, probably just quickly skip over it. Um, but I, I want to pick up with um, Jack still, in a sense, kind of selling the party to the narrator. Or not the party, I'm sorry, that's 1984, but the Brotherhood. That's, I guess, also 1984, but different. Anyway, selling the Brotherhood to the narrator. And so... Um, Brother Jack is dismissive of Mary, and we've seen him, I think, indirectly be dismissive of her in the cafe scene when he's talking about um, how people like Mary, who again buy into the system, um, seem to not be a part of the Brotherhood's plans other than being eliminated, you know, whatever that could possibly mean, but that they're not compatible with the communist system that the Brotherhood represents. And so to Jack, they're, you know, maybe literally and figuratively dead weight. They're, they're people who are going to be incompatible with the people's revolution and the ultimate um, society he sees forming under communism. So go to, what is her educational background? She's had very little more or less like the old couple that was evicted, somewhat but better able to take care of herself. She's tough, I said with a laugh. Does she ask a lot of questions? Are you friendly with her? She's been very nice to me, I said. She allowed me to stay on after I was unable to pay my rent. He shook his head, no. And I think there are a couple interesting things here. Um, one is that Jack is dismissive of her. And, you know, the thing that he's most concerned with at the start of this quote is her educational background. I think we get a sense that um, there's an element of elitism in communism as far as Ellison sees it. And we talked a little bit about that in class, the idea of class consciousness, class unconsciousness, um, that education is a central idea of communism. And if you can educate the working class to be aware of their exploitation, then the people's revolution will start. However, I think there's also an element of arrogance there, which is some people are smart enough to figure it out and some people aren't. And I think um, we see Ellison and the narrator and probably you as a reader too feeling uncomfortable here that Mary's being dismissed initially because of her educational background. We also see that exchange. Um, is she more or less like the old couple that was evicted somewhat, but better able to take care of herself? She's tough. Um, and so again, I think we see the narrator um, wondering if he ought to blame the evicted couple 
um, for being evicted. He, he describes Mary as better able to take care of herself than the evicted couple. He says she's tough. Um, it seems to be that he says that because he sees the evicted couple as weak. And I think we have to wonder if this is a result of Jack's question and the narrator maybe trying to appease him or trying to flatter him or just trying to give an answer that, like many points in the book, he doesn't know is right, but doesn't want to get in trouble with. Or um, if he honestly sees the evicted couple as somehow having faults. Um, I think it seemed like in that scene, he felt as though it was a system working against them. But with statements like these, we have to wonder if the narrator also feels as though the evicted couple was wrong or just naturally weak in some way. And I think some of his words there seem to suggest that. The quote goes on, does she ask a lot of questions? Are you friendly with her? She's been very nice to me. She allowed me to stay on after I wasn't able to pay my rent. So again, we have the narrator um, resisting referring to Mary as a friend. He, he explicitly discusses that with the reader in an earlier section. But when Jack asks, are you friendly with her? Not are you friends with her, but are you friendly with her? The narrator says, she's been very nice to me. And again, um, that's not a yes or no answer. I, I think most of us would say, you know, kindness is an element of friendship, but um, the narrator isn't answering yes or no to that question. And probably because he'd be uncomfortable as he was in an earlier chapter describing Mary as a friend of his. So um, if you go back to that Prince article, that would seem to make a lot of sense. Um, we probably wouldn't call home our friend, but we would say home is you know, a place that's nice and, and nice to us. And so maybe that makes sense with the Prince article, if you would like to use that um, quote there to make some sense of it. Anyways, um, we see Jack dismissing Mary. And again, it, it seems to be cold and callous to dismiss Mary because A, she's, according to, you know, the narrator has little education. Excuse me. That she, um, is kind to the narrator, is willing to kind of take him on and, and, you know, support him financially while he's looking for work, Jack rejects her. And, and if Mary is the source of kind of unconditional kindness and support in this book, any character who not only dismisses her, but rejects her outright, um, seems to sit poorly with, I think, most readers of this novel. Okay, one of those frustrating moments here where um, Ellison is kind of having some fun with the reader and directly avoiding um, Jack's, or not Jack's, but the narrator's name here. This is your new identity, Brother Jack said. Open it. Inside I found a name. Excuse me, you know it's the afternoon. Written on a slip of paper. This is your new name, Brother Jack said. Start thinking of yourself by that name from this moment. Get it down so that even if you were called in the middle of the night, you will respond. Very soon you shall be known by it all over the country. You are to answer to no other. Understand? I'll try, I said. And so, again, this contradiction. The narrator gets this new identity, this very promising identity, but this identity is forced on him. Um, Jack is commanding him, and the narrator looks at that name. We have to wonder, I think, again, if this is akin to, you know, Western names um, enslaved Africans were given when they were, you know, forcibly brought to this country. But Jack giving him this name and telling him, this is your name. Whoever you were before is erased because I am telling you who you will be now. Um, well, maybe it's an exciting opportunity for the narrator. It, it's a very um, domineering situation that the narrator is put in. And he's essentially submitting to have his identity replaced at least in this moment, by what Brother Jack literally gives him as a name. So again, Ellison kind of playing with that idea, but I think, you know, the story of African Americans in this country is that um, names were taken and given in a way probably Europeans did not experience. And um, the idea of Brother Jack, a Caucasian character, giving a black character like the narrator a new name um, probably has a lot of historical significance and a lot of um, kind of disturbing implications for us as far as readers. All right. This is a place where, um, especially later in the book, the idea of women's rights will be brought up. But we get a very deep sense that um, 
the Brotherhood is a boys club. And I, I think the name itself would suggest that it's not the personhood. Um, it's the brotherhood, you know, male identity is built into it. But the quote is, what is your opinion of the state of women's rights, brother? I was asked by a plain woman in a large black velvet tarn. Before I could open my mouth, Brother Jack had pushed me along to a group of men, one of whom seemed to know all about the eviction. Um, again, if Ellison is disenchanted with communism, one of his arguments seems to be that communism is not and everybody is included in this movement idea. The reality of communism, probably according to Ellison, is that, um, you know, it's probably privileged males, probably white males, probably successful white males, financially stable white males who um, are still at the forefront of the system. The fact that, you know, somebody wants to talk to the narrator about women's rights, a woman specifically wants to talk to him, and the narrator has rushed past her because it's probably seen as an unimportant question to Jack and the other men around him. Um, is telling. And especially later when the narrator gets more involved in the women's rights movement, um, it, it seems as though the party is very cynical as far as that goes and is only willing to talk about it as far as it gets them support for their major goals. Um, much, I guess, like we could say races, the, the idea of shouldn't he be a little blacker, like Emma says in the earlier quote, um, I think that suggests that the narrator's usefulness is in perhaps his tokenism, his ability to be a person of a group and seemingly speak for that group and get those advantages for um, some group that he's not a part of, some more powerful group that's kind of brought him into the fold for that purpose. So it, it's a short exchange, but it's a telling exchange, especially with what happens later in the novel. Um, to hell with this Booker T. Washington business. I would do the work, but I would be no one except myself. Whoever I was, I would pattern my life on that of the founder. They might think I was acting like Booker T. Washington, let them. But what I thought of myself, I would keep to myself. Yes, and I'd have to hide the fact that I would that I had actually been afraid when I made my speech. So uh, again, I, I see a weird sense of irony and perhaps immaturity here. Um, to hell with this Booker T. Washington business. I would do the work, but I would be no one except myself. Um, all right. So you're an individual. Sounds good. You're going to be true to yourself. Whoever I was, I would pattern my life on that of the founder. So in the same breath, while the narrator's saying he's no one but himself, he's saying, and myself, um, I want that person to be the founder. So it, it seems like there's a lot of kind of complexity. We might even say misunderstanding as to what independence, self-reliance and identity is for the narrator. We do see him taking his grandfather's advice, though. Um, but what I thought of myself, I would keep to myself. Yes, and I'd have to hide the fact that I'd actually been afraid when I made my speech. He is agreeing with the Brotherhood and saying, I'll, you know, say that I'll be the next Booker T. Washington to kind of make you happy and get ahead, but I'm going to do my own thing. But again, if the grandfather is hearing this, I wonder what his take would be, uh, because the narrator is saying, I'm going to do my own thing by being, you know, essentially another Booker T. Washington. It seems to miss the point of being yourself. And I think a deeper question could be um, in this book, what does it mean to be yourself? Are we always basing ourselves on versions of people or even myths of people that we have around us? But I think there's a deep sense of irony in that first sentence there, or that second sentence, I'm sorry. And the, the narrator um, declares that he's going to be himself by being the people he wants to be. It seems to kind of, in a way, humorously miss the point. All right, so a bit of exchange here. You're just who we need, we've been, or we've been looking for you. Oh, I said, how about a spiritual brother or one of those real good old Negro work songs? The brother does not sing, Brother Jack, roared staccato. Nonsense, all colored people sing. This is an outrageous example of unconscious racial chauvinism, Jack said. Um, this is the encounter with the man at the party who's drunk and wants the narrator to sing, um, you know, maybe a hymn um, from church that, that would be associated with kind of black culture. But um, it's an uncomfortable scene. I think instantly we recognize something wrong with expecting the narrator to know these songs and to sing these songs on demand um, for the kind of amusement of this man. At the same time, Brother Jack 
has an opportunity to maybe handle this in an empowering or at least a dignified way. And Jack seems to be showboating, um, much like he did earlier with the scene with um, Emma and, and telling Emma that the idea that he should be a little blacker is wrong. Um, Jack calls this an outrageous example of unconscious racial chauvinism. Um, I mean, is it unconscious because the man has literally had that much to drink and his, bre- his brain isn't registering thing any- anymore? Seems pretty conscious. And the idea of racial chauvinism um, almost seems euphemistic. It, 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 I mean, it's racism. Why racial chauvinism um, there is a term. So while Jack seems to be standing up, he also seems to be a bit of, of a sophist, somebody who's going to use words in ways that um, are slippery and in ways that maybe mean the opposite of what people actually want him to say there. And I think it makes Jack um, somebody who probably uses his intelligence and uses um, his status to disguise um, the fact that he's not actually opposed to what's going on here. Is he offended by this? Yes. Um, Is he offended by this because the narrator suddenly, you know, had his human dignity assaulted? I would argue it's much more likely that Brother Jack is um, trying to kind of uh, publicly signal to the narrator that this is inappropriate because the narrator's usefulness would evaporate if um, the narrator became disenchanted at this point with the brotherhood as a whole. So um, this goes on. I like their singing, the broad man said doggedly. The brother does not sing, Brother Jack cried, his face turning a deep purple. The broad man regarded him stubbornly. Um, Why don't you let him say whether he can sing or not? Come on, brother, get hot. Go down, Moses, he bellowed in a ragged baritone, putting down his cigar and snapping his fingers. Way down in Egypt's land, tell that old pharaoh to let my colored folk sing. I'm for the rights of the colored brother to sing, he shouted belligerently. So again, I mean, just over the top racism. At the same time, Ellison's going to bring up an interesting question here. And that's um, getting back to, I think, the idea of food earlier, that if uh, a black man wants to eat a yam, um, but that somehow supports a Southern stereotype of what a black man is, does that mean that no black man is allowed to kind of crave a yam from now on? The narrator and Ellison are going to ask, um, if it becomes a stereotype that black people sing these songs, does that then bar them from making a free choice to sing? And I, I think, again, without kind of saying that the man in any way is right by what he's doing, but why don't you let him say whether he can sing or not, um, raises a good point. Brother Jack is speaking for the narrator, and perhaps Brother Jack feels as though he's protecting the narrator and that, you know, the narrator being his guest um, is kind of expected to be defended by him. But at the same time, the narrator doesn't get to respond. Brother Jack does the talking for him. And doesn't that make the narrator, um, by Brother Jack robbing him of his opportunity to respond um, into a kind of dehumanized character the same way that this man telling him to sing these Negro spirituals for his benefit is dehumanizing him? Finally, um, we get back to that idea of the Exodus. And we talked about that a few times here, um, why that would be important to, you know, Southern Black culture, Of course, the idea of the Israelites, um, it has to deal with slavery. And so we talked about the narrator kind of having that connection. Um, What kind of we make of that last part there, I think that, you know, at best is difficult. The man is phrasing this in a racist way, but ultimately um, he wants to give the narrator some agency. He wants to give the narrator choice. And so I think we as readers are stuck in a really difficult moral situation. Um, If we respect a group and kind of want to defend the rights of that group, does that entail um, defending the rights of that group, maybe without offering that group a right to defend themselves in situations, Um, kind of jumping into the fray without asking if that's what's desired. Um, At the same time, it is um, asking somebody whether or not they're offended by clearly dehumanizing language. 
the right thing to do. And, and so Ellison asks incredibly important, incredibly complex questions that clearly we're still struggling with. And I think that's one of the things that makes this book so incredible is that a lot of the questions around gender, um, around sexuality, around race, um, those are still questions that we're grappling with in this way today. So we have um, the man here. I'm going to skip over it real quickly, but he gets thrown out. And moving on, the narrator starts to um, get kind of almost manically amused by the situation. He hit me in the face, I wheezed. He hit me in the face with a yard of chitterlings, bending double roaring the whole room, seeming to dance up and down with each rapid eruption of laughter. He threw a hog maw, I cried, but no one seemed to understand. My eyes filled, I can barely see. He's high as a Georgia pine, I laughed, turning to the group nearest me. He's absolutely drunk off music. And the narrator's right. The people don't understand this comment a, because the narrator is probably the only black Southerner in the room, um, but B, because we understand that reference to chitterlings there. That comes from um, his kind of fantasy about Dr. Bledsoe eating those with shame in private and then denying he does it. And so I think that reference, he hit me in the face with a yard of chitterlings, um, seems to be, again, that reference to he hit me in the face with something maybe I actually would have done. Maybe I even enjoy doing. But if I were to do at this point would be kind of a racial stereotype and then would be shameful. Um, and I think it's, again, a, a, an incredibly masterful way that Ellison brings that concept up by returning again to this idea of food um, as kind of the symbol of choice versus stereotype and how sometimes the existence of stereotypes that you as an individual probably have nothing to do with creating um, bar you from very real, sometimes very freely made choices to engage in an activity that could be seen as stereotypical. Um, moving on here, I fought against the painful laughter and as I calmed, I saw them looking at me with a sort of embarrassed gratitude. It was sobering Excuse me. And yet they seemed bent upon pretending that nothing unusual had happened. They smiled. Several seemed to come over and pound my back, shake my hand. It was as though I had told them something which they'd wish to hear very much to hear. Um, sorry, had rendered them an important service which I couldn't understand. But there it was working in their faces. And so the question becomes, what service has he rendered them that he doesn't understand? And it seems to be perhaps racial forgiveness, um, perhaps a sense that whatever guilt or whatever discomfort was created by this man who was a part of the brotherhood, racially insulting the narrator, that the narrator, in a sense, has, if not forgiven him, um, kind of absolved that. And um, it seems as though everyone in that room suddenly finds the narrator valuable because by him not getting angry at them, for allowing that to happen, they feel as though they've been forgiven for that happening. And if that's the case, again, we're left with a lot of complicated questions. Um, does something as big as race and racism allow one person of the offended race to forgive everyone else for what's happening? Um, complicated question. My personal opinion is most people would say no, that one person of a group probably does not have the right or the ability to speak for that whole group, even if it's to provide forgiveness. But we see the narrator feeling uncomfortable. And I think, in a sense, he realizes his value to this group. Again, it's not him as a humanity, but or him as a human, but him as a symbol, him as someone who can assuage a sense of guilt or a sense of discomfort simply by now being part of that group. Shouldn't there be some way for us to be asked to sing? Shouldn't the short man have the right to make a mistake without his motives being considered consciously or unconsciously malicious? After all, he was singing or trying to. What if I asked him to sing? I watched the little woman dressed in black like a missionary, winding her way through the crowd. What on earth was she doing here? What part did she play? Well, whatever she meant, she's nice and I like her. Um, and I think Ellison, this is his most direct way of asking us this question. It gets back to Brother Jack's idea 
Um, when Brother Jack and the narrator are first talking, Brother Jack, I think very ironically and pretty offensively, says, why does it always have to be about race with you people? But the narrator seems to ask another form of that. And the narrator seems to ask, is there a way in culture and society and language where we can talk to one another without having race be a part of it? Um, could you ask a black man to sing a quote unquote Negro spiritual without it coming off like racism or language kind of couched in race. And um, the fact that the narrator asks this makes it interesting. I think if we've heard this question asked before in the novel, it comes from Mr. Emerson's son, when he wants to, just before he reveals the contents of the letter, speak to the narrator completely honestly without the trappings or masks of civilization. And so it's interesting that the narrator recycles that question. When we were discussing Mr. Emerson's response to it, we said that that seemed kind of like maybe a foolish, naive question. But it seems to me like when I read it coming from the narrator, it, it seems more complex and sincere, even though it's the same idea. Can language ever be capable or society ever be capable of setting something like race or gender or class aside when one person speaks to another or if, um, you know, a white person is talking to a black person about stereotypically black things, is there always the assumption of racism? Is there always the assumption of hate underlying that? And um, again, I think if you can answer that, you know, you have a lot of people who are willing to listen to you about how society should kind of form from here on out, because it's a question that's probably propelled human history without an answer satisfying to every human up until now. All right, um, finally here, we have, just to kind of get this idea out, um, we have one more final irony. Just then Emma came up and challenged me to dance and I led her toward the floor as the piano played, thinking of the vet's prediction and drawing her to me as though I danced with such as her every evening. For having committed myself, I felt that I could never allow myself to show surprise or upset, even when confronted with situations furthest from my experience. Otherwise I might be considered undependable or unworthy. Um, first, the irony that Emma comes up and challenges him to dance. And I think if there's an offensive stereotype um, accompanying Black identity, like singing, um, dancing, it's probably the other one. And so Emma coming up and seeming to assume that because the narrator's Black, he can dance, um, it, it seems to suggest that maybe the narrator isn't willing to kind of deal with that anymore, and he's probably exhausted by this point, or that depending on who it comes from, it's not seen that way. Emma, as this attractive white woman, isn't necessarily held to the same level of scrutiny everyone else at the party is this drunk white man, you know, challenging the narrator to sing a Negro spiritual. Um, finally here, we see that the narrator saying that um, his plan to kind of handle situations is to never allow himself to show surprise or upset. And while that seems like maybe a noble goal, um, I think we've seen the narrator at many points fall into trouble with that. I mean, the letters that he was giving out, um, even as far back as taking Mr. Norton to see True Blood, um, questioning that situation being a little more uncertain probably would have helped himself. So again, has the narrator matured or is he just rephrasing the same sort of ideas he's had about how to make his way through the world in slightly more kind of complex terms? My personal sense is it's the latter. Um, next thing, the thing to do was to be prepared as my grandfather had been when it was demanded that he quote the entire United States Constitution as a test of his fitness to vote. He had confounded them all by passing the test, although they still refused him the ballot. Anyway, these were different. And so again, tremendous sense of irony. This, I think, irony that for people of color in this country, um, oftentimes the deck was so stacked against you that no matter what success you managed to achieve or what feat you managed to accomplish, society was kind of built in such a way to kind of bar you from, you know, participating in it. I think we see that with um, King of the Bingo Game, when the Bingo King is, you know, either beaten or killed by the end of the story, even though he's managed to get the double zeros. Also, the grandfather um, felt as though his failure was giving up his gun after the Civil War and during Reconstruction. So the narrator saying that, you know, this is kind of his proudest achievement 
while it's impressive, the grandfather clearly saw it as a failure in his final moments. The grandfather felt like, you know, defending himself, perhaps even becoming violent towards other people would have been a notable achievement. Um, memorizing the United States Constitution and then being rejected from voting, is there a success in that? Perhaps, you know, it's admirable he could do it and prove to himself and prove to those immediate people that, you know, he could do something like that. But the system was set up such that um, it didn't matter what you were able to do. I mean, if you could um, create something out of thin air, you weren't going to vote at that time if you were black. So I, I think the narrator seems to be changing his stories around to kind of fit what's important to him in this moment. Um, all right. So I might as well admit right now, I thought there are many things about people like Mary that I dislike. For one, they seldom know where their personalities end and yours begins. They usually think in terms of we, well, I've always tended to think in terms of me. And that has caused some friction, even with my own family. Brother Jack and others talked in terms of we, but it was a different, bigger we. And so um, we see the narrator figuring out, I think, a way that he's trying to dislike Mary. And there are probably a few reasons. One is he has to do that for the brotherhood. But another is, as we'll see with the next chapter and even the end of this chapter, he feels like he disappoints her um, by leaving the house, by not continuing to rely on her and kind of be present when she wants to, you know, nurture him, it, it, the narrator gets a sense that he's betrayed Mary. And so I think we understand just as readers that him trying to turn Mary into a villain or somebody who has hurt him is a natural human way to feel good about what you're doing that seems hurtful. Um, if she seems totally undeserving of that kind of behavior, it, it makes it feel a lot worse to engage in. Also, it's interesting that the narrator um, says that, you know, Mary is inferior because she believes in we, um, well, I believe in me. I mean, Mary saved him. And that sense of community seems to be what has been most helpful to the narrator. So I think, again, that the pronouns are important, saying they, once again, when he used to talk about Mary in terms of we, um, but then talking about his own identity perhaps even selfishly being first, um, and then making an exception for the brotherhood. Brother Jack and the others talk in terms of we, but it was a different, bigger we, um, willing to accept community when it seems kind of most beneficial to him and being willing to reject community when it doesn't seem to benefit him. I think, again, shows the narrator's uh, selectivity of what he believes, why he believes, and when he believes what he believes. All right, so I believe we're at the end there. Um, talking about a party down at the square, um, incredibly disturbing story. And I, I think one of the things that makes it um, interesting from the perspective of reading Invisible Man right now is that um, it seems as though uh, the protagonist of that story is white and is racist. Um, the Wikipedia page, uh, which I would encourage you to read for this story, um, says that the N-word is used over 40 times. And it, it seems like Ellison, in a way, is asking that question of, does a word like that ever become desensitizing? I think the horrors of that story, the man being burned alive, um, tells us that, um, no, that, that when words are accompanied by the deeds and the clear hate of that, that um, every time the N-word appears in that story, it's shocking. And I, I think Ellison um, wrote a brilliant story that, that makes that point um, through art rather than through philosophy. And um, I really appreciated it. Incredibly uncomfortable to read, incredibly upsetting to read. Um, I think like much of this, of this book is, but um, a story that, I think shows Ellison just at his finest still and showing us things that we've been thinking about all our lives in ways that make us feel like we're seeing them for the very first time again. Um, I think Invisible Man too is kind of a mark of that literature. I always find myself questioning things around me um, that I take for granted every other time in a year or my life when I'm not reading this book. 
And um, I think if it gets you to that place um, of just questioning, Ellison probably would say he doesn't mean to offer you any answers. He just wants to cause you to ask these questions. He feels like he's done his job. So hopefully that gets you some idea of 14 and the um, story itself. Again, pick one or the other, um, either Kitchen, Mary Rambo's Blues Kitchen, or A Party Down at the Square to use for your um, reading response and uh, tie chapter 14 in with it somewhere. Whichever one you pick, those will be due by tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. And we will start discussing 15 tomorrow and hopefully doing some sort of discussion board or public comment thing tomorrow to get you more involved. So I hope you have a good afternoon and I will talk to you soon.